Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the exciting world of web resource management. Uh, we know there were a lot of options in this time slot, so thanks for joining us. Uh, we hope you get a lot out of this. Um, my name is John Kulish. Um, I'm an information security engineer going on a decade or so of, of experience. Started my security career in things like uh, proxy, securing email, DLP, that kind of thing. And about halfway through, pivoted into the AppSec world, where I've been uh, more focused on perimeter defenses with WAF and bot mitigation. Starting then again to pivot into things like secure code reviews and uh, threat modeling, and what we're here to talk about today, web resource management. Oh, great catch. Um, and joining me today is the architect that guided us through this journey, Piyush. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Piyush Patnaik. And uh, I am an application security architect at eBay. I am with eBay since 2010. And uh, over the past 12 years, I have worked with, or worked on like threat modeling, pen testing, static analysis, uh, bot detection, there was a time, uh, zero trust. And recently, I've been focused on uh, supply chain security, both client side as well as server side, and exploring more into AI solutions, how we can solve security problems with AI, right? So uh, I'm going to start the presentation with one question. How many of you know what CSP is, like content security policy? OK, amazing, as expected. So uh, and do you use it in your organization? Fewer hands. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, well, this talk, we are not going to talk about like what content security policy is, like what are the directives, I guess. Uh, like most of you already know what CSP is and how it works, what are all its directives, and there are plenty of resources available outside which can tell you more than what we could present in the 45 minutes here. So rather, we would be talking about our journey uh, and why we went with content security policy, how we did it, uh, what are the pitfalls, and what's the benefit out of it, right? So. We plan this presentation in a way that me and John will go back and forth into a few topics, uh, and then we'll share all of our findings. So for those of you who didn't have your hand up, or for those watching along afterwards with the recording, um, content security policy is a, a response header. It protects against things like uh, cross-site scripting, click jacking. Um, and at a high level, it's a resource safe list. But when it comes to implementing that response header, and especially its scale, the complexity of the header, the options that are available to you, it quickly becomes a daunting task. And if you take a look here, just the combination of headers, directives, options, resource types, the amount of ways you can arrange those together, it, there's a lot of room for error. And that's before you actually deploy it and start collecting the limitless violations and try to identify all those resources themselves. And as part of that review, there's just a sample here at the bottom. So a couple key notes is that the, the header name shows to you that this policy is in report mode. And the value of the header actually consists of a list of directives. Those directives are, in turn, lists of resources and options. And so that list of directives is going to make or break your policy. And how you choose to leverage them will determine whether or not your policy is, one, effective, and two, efficient. And CSP, for efficiency's sake, relies on something called fallback processing, uh, which only occurs in the event that a directive is missing from the header. So for example, if a browser is trying to load, load script source element and it's missing from the header, it will fall back to script source. And again, if that is missing, it'll bounce down to default source. And while there are quite a few prefetch directives here listed in this process flow, the ones we concerns are, concern ourselves most with, and kind of our b default baseline, are in orange. So script and style source, those are self-explanatory. Connect source is for async calls, uh, your AJAX and your XHR. And default source is just kind of your catch-all. As you can see, most things flow back to default source, so it's a good thing to have by default. There is a second group as well called navigation directives, and Piyush is going to tell us a little bit more about them. So like John mentioned, we have uh, most of these directives fall, have a fallback, right? So and. Mostly all of them fall back to default source, uh, other than some exception. But we have frame ancestors and report URI who doesn't have a fallback mechanism. right? So, so it's critical for us to make sure that frame ancestors, report URI, and al along with these 
uh, four, which is script source, style source, connect source, and default source is part of your CSP policy. There's nothing stopping you to, uh, there's nothing like stopping you there. You could add more directives to your CSP policy based on your organization's requirement. But we believe that, that these six directives in a CSP policy could prevent you from unwanted threats and risk. So talking about risk, how many of you know all the JavaScripts that you have on your web application and what's its purpose? Okay, well, you are one step, or I guess I'll say 10 step ahead of everybody else. So we classified into four sections, like JavaScripts, outbound network calls, which is like XHR calls, iframes, and then the other third party resources. So in the world of dynamic web application, JavaScripts changes like anything, right? So the moment you have integrated with a vendor, which introduces a JavaScript on your page, and the next very moment the JavaScript is different, right? They're sending something else, they're maybe uh, adding five more JavaScripts to it, adding, making 10 more API calls, right? So, so it's very difficult to keep track of it, and if you try to add um, SRI to your JavaScript, integrity, which is a big no, from mostly all the vendors that we have worked with. They obviously don't, don't want to limit the scale at which they can make changes to their JavaScript. So not knowing what's there on your application and integrating with too many JavaScript is a, is a huge risk, right? And then when you talk about outbound network calls, these JavaScript makes a bunch of network calls which again we are not aware of, which might also change when the JavaScript changes. Then we have frames. Now you want to be create, make your application modular. You want to integrate your application with other domains, even the domains that you know, that you have or you own. Um, well, there are, there are the, what are the options here? I mean, do, if, you, if you go with X frame options, like the options are simply either same origin or deny, right? So it doesn't give you a lot of room to what you want to do. Um, should you keep it open? Like just like leave it like with no headers, like well that's gonna be make your make your application vulnerable to click jacking attacks, right? So and then finally we have third party other third party resources, mostly fonts style, or or maybe images. Well, most of the web application or most companies they host these resources internally in their own CDN, but there might be some things that might come from uh, from other resources, and if you are not aware of it, it might be it might uh, create uh, some issues for your application, like if they change in real time, you could have a broken UI on the hand, which in turn could be into uh, convert into an availability impact. And with the change in compliance and policies around the world, uh, the recent change that has happened in PCI 4.0, which everybody have to comply, uh, I guess, by end of 2025, it's absolutely critical to understand what's going on in your application, especially in your payments page, if you want to be compliant with the PCI uh, changes. Now we'll, we'll talk more about PCI later in the slides. So uh, in the next section of this presentation, we'll be focusing on our, our key, uh, the key takeaways from our learnings uh, and what we did. Uh, so over to you, John. So developer productivity, CI, CD, shift left, choose your buzzword, right? We, we can keep asking more and more of our developers, and it's really easy as a security team to say, hey, CSP is required. Go do CSP, but don't mess it up, right? Um, it's, it's really hard to ask them to take on more tasks, because I have to remember, as security professionals, our job is to remove obstacles, and implementing a new complicated and potentially misconfigurable header, that's not removing obstacles, right? So how do we ask hundreds, if not thousands, of developers in some of these big orgs to become SMEs in a header that is super useful, but not widely enough used that some still haven't heard of it, right? And when we're rolling this out, people say, what is this, is this new? It's been around since 2012, like not new, right? So how do we get this implementation going? So, implementation. So like any new technology or feature, a solution has to integrate into the existing developer ecosystem, right? It needs to be simple to implement, to onboard, and to get fully to the end. Um, so here are some of the things that helped us get there. The first thing is user-friendly documentation. Um, and user-friendly is the key. It would be ideal if your developers knew that these were living documents. These are not set in stone and their feedback is very required. I can promise you that 
The docs, the processes, and the successes we've seen in this space are because our developers regularly know they can come to us and say, hey, this is bad, this is not useful, and more importantly than that, they know we're gonna act on it and then go back and update those things for them. Uh, second element is training. So this can take many different forms. Um, it can be a formal training course that either you create or a third party creates for you. You can have informal trainings like lunch and learns and um, just ad hoc Zooms, right? But if your company already has a security champions program, and it should, hint, hint, um, this is a great place to leverage those relationships, right? Um, those, those connections exist between security and development, and it's just a chance to grow more security culture. Tooling is a big one, and that's um, a primary focus of what we talk about later, but um, simple, user-friendly tools and automation are always welcome. And the last piece is templating. So in that earlier slide, you saw there's a lot of room for error. So if you start with templates that work out of the box, we don't have to expect our users to be SMEs from the moment they start onboarding. And templating and tooling leads us into centralized management. So as, as long as we need to have a place that can act as our source of record for things like which policy versions exist, where those policy versions are deployed, let's make them more user friendly, right? We already have to use them, so let's add policy creation flows, one click templating, bring in your violations at a glance so they don't have to go to a separate violations or logging area, and the triaging capabilities for our IR teams to also come here. So if we're trying to reduce hurdles and smooth things out, a single place for all things CSP is a great start. So taking a step back from, sorry, cards. All right, so we have developer buy-in, uh, we have tooling to get started, right? So. Um, our, our journey explored several different architectures along the way before we found what really fits for us, and Piyush is gonna tell us more about them. Thank you, John. So we started our journey into CSP around six, six seven years ago, right? So, and when we started this, we, uh, we wanted to quickly deploy something, like um, quickly make it available for everybody. So we simply created a CSP policy and then we, we added it to the code itself and then we just pushed it to Git, right? So, well, that worked pretty well uh, in the application server. We could simply attach a policy over here. But then eventually when we had to update the policy, when we have to like make changes, if there is there's a new resource available now, you have to add it. We had to work with the developers a lot, right? So, and then developers have their own priority. They're working on maybe 15 different things and then they ha hardly have any time to work with you to make changes to the to the policy here, and even though you create you uh, change, make the make changes to the policy on your own and issue a PR to them, even for them to evaluate the PR and merge and do the, all their testing and then deploy, was taking a lot of time, right? So uh, it's simply a matter of developer bandwidth. So we we thought of a different approach that why not go into a reverse proxy route, right? So why not have the CSPs policy deployed into something, uh, into either your uh, Nginx or your Envoy, right? So, but then, um, so after, after, after thinking about this, we will mostly be switching the problem from the developers into a different team who manages this, right? So, so now, um, now we have to work with this team and then maybe they have their own priority and it was simply not working out, right? Um, so that's when we thought of creating our own like a, an API and a UI, uh, a kind of a CSP manager management uh, tool, we call it. And this was a game changer for us, right? So with the help of this UI, we could like create policies, we could like manage policies, we could even, we can have uh, a lot of uh, interaction with the developers and then, and even deploy policies, right? So. We started creating this UI with two two scopes, uh, two user scopes in mind. One is admin, which is uh, everybody who's part of the application security team, or not everybody, I think, uh, a part of our team. And then we had a user scope. Now, now, within the user scope, the users had multiple roles based on the application they own. And uh, based on those, those roles, they can create a policy. They can also edit a policy. They can also, they can deploy the policy. They can look into what's going on in their policy, who is making changes to it, and all those things, right? 
Um, we also give them a UI where they could come back and then see what are the violations that we are that uh, they have for their application, what version of the policy is having what kind of violation, and then we, we give them a clear pictorial representation of how they can make changes to the to the policy based on the violation they have received, right? So it's it, it's it's a side by side comparison with what your policy is and what your violations are, and you could simply make changes to your policy that way. Well, but then the problem was uh, we are not a 24/7 team, right? And well, CSP has a lot of benefit, but it could have some major availability impact on your application if you do not configure it correctly and you put it in block mode, right? So, well, how do we solve this problem? I mean, like I said, since we are, we are not a 24-7 uh, team, we had to work with teams or educate the teams who, who works 24-7, like your site reliability engineering or your incident response team, right? So, so that's when we, 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 we worked with them, we educated them on what CSP is, what, what our tool is, how to manage the CSP policy. Um, we gave them specific roles. We created specific roles for them uh, that they could have in the system. They could go uh, in, in, the, in the incident. They could go update a policy or even like completely roll it back if there is an availability uh, concern that's coming in from an application, right? So that was very critical for us to, us to do that, right? To, to maintain the health of the, of the application. Well, um, then after the management of the policy, I think it, it's, it's, we, we, we looked into it. Now it was working uh, pretty well. We could like create policies and do all those things. We could provide a lot of dashboards to the user about how their policy is performing and stuff. But how do you deploy this policy, right? How, when it comes to deployment of this policy, what would you do, right? And then who can deploy this policy? I mean, like I mentioned earlier, people who have access to the application should be able to go and then typically deploy the policy. Uh, but should it be just one person who can deploy the policy, make a change in production just like that? Well, I thought like that shouldn't be the case if you are, if you have, or if you are trying to solve maybe inside the threats. So we thought of a two person review, which is very similar to how most of the code deployment or code commit works, right? So there's one person who can create a policy based on your application. They can uh, deploy that policy to dev, staging, test it out, and then promote it to production. But they would, we would need another person from their team to look into that and then deploy that policy in production, right? So, so that way we make sure that there are at least two people involved in making, when we are making any changes to the CSP policy. Well, um, then the question then arises like, okay, there are two people who can deploy it, but how should we deploy? How should we go towards deploying the policy actually in the, in the pods? or in the, in the application. There could be, in an application, let's say there could be, based on the traffic, there could be uh, like maybe 10 or 100 different app, uh, pods running in, right? So at that point in time, uh, there's something, uh, we introduce something called deployment cap or partial deployment, right? So we, we, I, we took 5% of the, of the system and then we thought like, let's deploy this policy over here. Because if you just take it and deploy it across all 100 application or all 100 VMs, uh, then, and if something goes wrong, your application, like you could have an availability impact in your hand, right? So, so it's, it was important for us to test this policy out initially, even though you have tested it in dev and staging, sometimes the production, the resources that you have in production and the things that you ha have in production is, is a little different than, than staging and dev. So it's important for you to do this testing on production, right? So we deployed it fi in 5% five, five of the machines uh, and then we monitor for violations, uh, the deviation in the violation that you used to, uh, that you received. We monitored uh, how the application logs are behaving. And then we also created something which was very critical here is to understand how these policies are deployed in each and every pod. So we, we get signals from every pod which tells us which policy is deployed in that pod and that, that helped us debug a lot when we were doing this process, right? So, um, uh, and then, if everything goes well, if, if the violation goes well, uh, if your application logs is performing well, then we could continue and then go up to 100%. And, but if there, is any, uh, there are any issues, we could roll back to the previous policy. Very similar to how a typical Canary deployment works um, uh, in the uh, development world. Well, the next thing was uh, what scaling it, right? So when we talk about scale, uh, it, it's, a, it's a different thing than 
scaling into multiple applications. Uh, we have creating a policy for a single application and deploying it was the easy part, I believe, because you could study that application for a longer period of time. You could look into what network resources it has and then create a policy for it, right? But what about, what about making changes to all the policies at once? Like, do you have a need where you need to make changes to all the policies uh, in, your in your organization? Well, every organization has some kind of either a platform or a framework team that control some pieces of your code, right? It could be like uh, a templating. It could, they could manage the CSS in the organization to decide how your web application will look like. Um, they can also, there could be like applications or teams who manages your header and footer, or they might also manage, let's say they have a program on bot detection and they, uh, that team is adding JavaScripts to all of your, uh, all the pages uh, in the organization. Well, similarly, there could be other use cases like fraud detection and, and many more, right? So well, how do you make sure that changes that are introduced by these teams are added into the policy, uh, added into all the policies that you have? Well, that's that's, extremely critical because if you don't support that, you risk either breaking your application or not having adequate protection over there, right? So a simpler approach would be to create a policy here for every application. Let's say for application one, you create a change, uh, you uh, change their policy, you deploy that into application one. For application two, you create it and then deploy it and so and so forth. You can create an application for each and every policy and deploy it. But if you consider the scale of an organization, especially uh, for for us uh, in eBay, there will be like thousands of applications, and you could have like tens of different uh, tens of thousands of different pages, right? So, so this was uh, a major issue for us. Like we can't like work with every team every time there is a change uh, in any of the policy uh, that we want to uh, implement. Well, we thought of a different um, solution. What if you can create a change in the policy server and then your system could analyze how to deploy that change into all the policies, right? As an example, if you can see, we, we introduced one single change in the policy server here. Let's, uh, let's say that change is image source abc.com, right? We want to make add this uh, change to all the policies. And uh, let's say we go to the first application and then we see that the application have script source, has connect source, has image source, and then the default source. Uh, sorry, I think, yeah. Well, if you think about it, uh, what the system could do over here is it could understand where to add this uh, change that you have introduced. In this policy, you already have an image source, so it could go and then simply make that change that to add an image source abc.com over there. But let's say you don't have image source, right? So you have another application which do not have image source. What should you do? Should the should we create an image source directive? Well, if you do that, your application will most likely break because then the it's not then default source is no longer the uh, the fallback for image source, and all of your images in the application is going to rely on the image source directive to work, right? So so that's obviously a no. So you need to add it to the default source over here. So which means. Uh, the policy server and then the, your tool needs to be intelligent enough to know how to make change to that policy in order to cater to the change that you have created. Well, this way, with one change, you could actually add different policies to different application, right? And that's when, that's, that's then up to the developers on how they want to evaluate and then deploy this. Well, uh, Next thing is violations, which John is gonna uh, talk about. So CSP is a living header, and unless your website never makes a change, which that includes third-party resource dependencies, not just yours, you're gonna have to eventually update this header, right? And the key to knowing how to do that is your violation logs. Um, this is an iterative process. Um, it starts with uh, report mode policy. You throw it in um, report mode. Um, put it out there in the world and start collecting logs. Step two is just wait. Now, some traffic can be synthesized. You've got test scripts, test users, things like that. But if you want to know how your policy acts on your website in the real world, you have to wait for real users to interact, right? So 
after waiting, you get that violation log set, you look through them, you see what resources look like they belong, and you add those, and you rinse and repeat. And it's a manual iterative process. And if we talk about developer productivity, asking them daily or weekly even to go through and say, hey, go look, hey, go look, hey, go look, and that response is, okay, what should I add? You're the security expert, what should I add? It's, it's not ideal, right? So let's add some layers of ease to the violation process. Um, the first thing that came to us was that constant question, what should I add? So we need a list of trusted third parties, and more importantly, we need to annotate that in our violation logs for our developers. They need to know immediately when they see a violation whether or not it's trusted by us, by the org, by someone else, right? It's a lot easier to say, I've got hundreds of violations, but these two are already marked for me, safe to add, right? Now this can be anything from marketing, SEO, cookie tracking, like it doesn't have to be a security resource, but it certainly could be. We have um, fraud detection flows, all sorts of things, right? And our developers can't be expected to know every corner of our business. And realistically, neither can we. Your company may not have a list of vendor relationships, much less their full digital supplies and what you integrate into what application, right? But instead of using all of these as one-off scenarios, use these conversations as mechanisms to grow that list of resources and then bring that knowledge back into the tool. A second component is to be able to see how a new policy that somebody is working on interacts with existing violations before you deploy it, right? So if I'm sitting there and I'm working on a new policy and I think it's where I want it to be, I already have existing violation logs in this system, right? Show me as I'm building it whether or not it's checking off the ones I want or maybe I'm including too much or something of that nature, right? So see how it works beforehand. And that's not perfect. Um, some violations, some resources, they chain together in series, so you're not gonna catch everything. But it does save just a misconfiguration, a typo. It's gonna save a lot of time there because early on we had a lot of, oh, you misspelled that one. Or, well, no, that one wasn't, that one wasn't the best idea, right? So make sure people know before they're committing, before they're going through that effort, if they're already there. So a quick example of how this might work. In policy 1.0, we just have something deployed in report only to, to collect violations, right? In this case, you see your own company resources at the, at the top. If you were leveraging templates that were already set for your company's known needs, that would be missing already. You jump down to a third party resource. Well, I, I think we need that, but I'm not sure. You need to use these opportunities to start those conversations. And at the very least, you will have a better grasp of how your company does business. And then you're always gonna have garbage. Don't add that garbage. Remember, this is a resource safe list, so we're treating it differently than some other security mechanisms, right? Anything that we're adding to our CSP, we are taking responsibility for that risk. So we deploy a new policy version, we've identified some things. Well, third party is now, they have a CDN. Something to remember constantly is this is user browser generated violations, right? These are gonna look different every day, every hour. You're not gonna have a consistent readout constantly, so it may take time. Some of your high, tra high traffic flows might take a couple hours to get a good cross section. Some might take days or weeks. So continue that policy, identify what you need, add it back into your policy and redeploy. And at a certain point, you're gonna get to where your violations just look like noise. Our goal here is site, um, functionality, right? It's not just things that are theoretically non-nefarious. These are things we need for functionality. And once you get to that point, you're safe to move into block mode. And as we're mo moving through all these iterations and trying to figure out what's, what's the best end state, remember two of our goals were effective, yes, but also efficient. And There is no one size fits all that fits both those criteria, even within our own company, right? We have a, a very different use case for a lot of different apps, so we can't just have that single recommendation. Um, and so a couple things to think about while you're reaching that balance is that if your directive and its fallbacks are missing from your policy, that is an implicit allow. So specifically for frame ancestors, this single-handedly is gonna keep other people from framing you and getting you with click jacking, right? So, if you don't want your site framed by others, you need that to some capacity. And similarly in Frame Ancestors, a little tricky situation is it's the method of choice to replace the X-Frame Options header. Who's still using X-Frame Options? Okay, less hands than I expected, I appreciate that. 
So that's been deprecated for ages because like we said, CSP has been here for ages, but by design or not, these two headers don't play well together. And so if you're on this CSP journey and you have X-Frame options, you should really consider removing your X-Frame options header before you put this in enforcement mode specifically. Um, another component here is that if you're like us and your web resources are loaded globally and you present those globally on those different top level global domains, um, it's even a policy template that we're trying to keep the size down on, it's gonna bloat quickly. By default, we had between 22 and 30, depending on the use case. So if, if we go in and add 22 to 30 domains to every single directive we wanna use, that policy just blew up. And that's before the developers have had a chance to go through their logs and add violations and that kind of thing, right? So one of the things we have as, is this mechanism in this system to say, figure out where the site is loading. Is it loading in Germany? Is it .de, right? Only load my domains that are relevant to resources needed in .de. So instead of needing my 22 to 30 domains, I'm now loading two or three. And so within our policy creation window, all we're really gonna see is this kind of variable that we know calls out in the back end. And then the developers don't have to worry about it. They don't care if, there's, if they're piloting in Singapore or if they're piloting in Australia or somewhere else, or they're now rolling out to the rest of the world. It doesn't matter to them. They have that one variable to add. And guess what? It's in our template, so they're not adding it anyway. And the last piece here is a size, right? The, the reality is size matters. Um, when we came to, so this 2K, this is our recommendation. That's what works for us. This is a business decision on your end. But remember that an overly large policy, it can, um, it's tough to read for one. When it comes to troubleshooting in an IR scenario, just asking someone else who doesn't normally go through these to say, hey, what's wrong with it? It can take a little bit. Um, if your company also has site speed optimization teams that dedicate their lives to shaving mill milliseconds off of your site load time, they're gonna get pretty upset with you if you start throwing, throwing giant junky headers into their mix. Um, and you may also find super hypothetically that your CDN has its own header size limits that you didn't know about. And all of a sudden you're thinking of console and application errors and for some reason people are running into CDN errors and you don't know what that means. So uh, there's just a lot of ways to go wrong in that. And so, you know, recommendation, keep it as small and efficient as possible. Rely on the tools that CSP has inherently to keep that fallback going and to keep things small and efficient. So let's take a step back from CSP for a second and talk about uh, web resource management as a whole with Piyush. Thank you, John. Well, uh, in the next part of this presentation, we would like to focus on what web resources management is for us, right? Or what, how do we monitor it, right? So I think CSP is an amazing solution to have, but CSP can only prevent you or your application from, let's say, Unwant, unknown and unwanted uh, domains, right? So if you already have a domain added to your CSP policy, well, it implicitly trusts that, right? So, but it cannot protect you from, from any threats that comes from that domain, which is mostly what supply chain security is all about. So if you think about supply chain security, especially in this case, which is the client side supply chain security, uh, the threat might come from a domain or a library that you have already trusted, right? So how do you how do you identify something like that? Well, uh, in a typical page, as in this three example, you have like these three resources that are very critical. Well, you could have like, you, you obviously have more than three. There could be like many different type of resources uh, on your page, but how do you keep track of all of them, right? So what we thought of is adding a simple script, a simple monitoring script to your page which could collect information about what's going on in your application. Well, you could, you could go, you could modify that script to do a lot more, but to start with, just to get an idea about what's going on in your application, like how many JavaScripts is my application actually loading? So if it's, even if it's coming from a trusted domain, is it like one JavaScript or is it like five JavaScripts? And then why do we need the other four JavaScripts, right? First of all, it is adding to all those network calls that your browser have to make which you need to understand. And uh, the other thing is also understanding how these JavaScripts are changing over the period of time, right? So that is, that that's becomes very critical, and then we'll talk about it in the next slide, why. 
this solution could also provide a feedback to your CSP solution. So you could, you could see what's going on in an application in real time, and then you could say, yeah, this looks new, and then maybe, maybe the CSP is e either catching it or not. I should send a feedback to the CSP service to maybe look into that if this, if this needs to be added to the policy, right? Uh, and then this way, you could actually understand why do we have like uh, these many resources coming in and what are they doing? I mean, you could also look into, let's say the network call that the JavaScripts are making. So you could, on your page, uh, if it's making three network calls, like what are those network calls? Like, is there a compromised JavaScript that's sitting on, a, on my page, which is let's say reading sensitive information, maybe it's sitting on your, or on your page which handle uh, payments data, right? Is it reading PII information? Is it reading PCI data? Is it like sending it out? Like you could, you could collect the logs. I understand this is like, this is a very expensive task for a web application to do this, do this in line, but if you keep, if you collect these logs and then you do an offline processing of this data to understand what's going on, you could get a pretty good idea about what your web application is dealing with. And with the new changes, like I mentioned earlier in the, uh, with the changes with PCI4 to understand what's going on, this becomes extremely, extremely critical. Now, John is gonna talk about the changes in the PCI uh, 4 and then how uh, web resource management and content security policy is helping. So for most of us here at this conference, just adding a little more security is reason enough to get started and to get moving and making changes, right? If you go back and you say, hey, I learned how to stop cross-site scripting and clickjacking with a response header, let's get started. But for most of these efforts, we need leadership buy-in. We need funding, we need we need the boss's boss's boss to say, that's my priority too. And if you happen to work in the e-commerce space, that solution is, is compliance, right? That's PCI, like Piyush mentioned. There's a new version out, it takes effect 2025. So if your company is like ours, they're not waiting. They're trying to meet those demands this year so they can see what's wrong and then correct them before, nobody wants to get fined <laughs> before that new version goes into, into place. So there's some rewrites, some rearrangement with this new um, PCI version. 6.4 is very similar to the previous version. It's the high-level AppSec. It's gonna have your things like your WAF, your secure coding. Uh, this year it specifically calls out CSP. And when it comes to PCI guidance, or I should say PCI's format, there is a guidance section that actually gives you little suggestions on how to be compliant for these sections. And 6.4 currently reads, and I'm gonna read these straight because you don't mess with PCI. Um, a CSP which limits the locations a consumer browser can load a script from and transmit account data to. So if my company wants to be compliant with 6.4, hey, they just said use CSP. That's, boom, that's an easy win, right? Give me my buy-in. Well, 11.6 is where it gets a lot more interesting because there was a major shift from 3.2 to 4.0 that is focusing on knowing and understanding and blocking web resources where it used to be just a larger security focus, There's, they're now leaning into the resources themselves that can affect your end users, right? And so the guidance section here says, a CSP which limits the locations a consumer browser can load a script from, nope, that sounds familiar. Violations of the CSP can be reported to the entity using the report to or report URI CSP directives. So again, it comes to well, hey, they just said use CSP and they handed you it even easier. They said, use these directives if you wanna be compliant. So they're already doing a lot of the salesmanship for you. Now, 11.6 also has a lot of focus on JavaScript and resource integrity. So that means not just knowing what version ran or tried to run or identifying those scripts, but figuring out what specific version of, that, of those scripts ran and were they authorized to run in the first place, right? And so that's out of scope of CSP itself, but there isn't really a one-stop shop for compliance. This just helps you get there with some other tools. And while there is no one overarching solution for securing your web apps, we hope that the, today you come away realizing that a properly configured and deployed CSP with some additional resource monitoring is a big win in your depth of defense. Thank you. Questions? <laughs>
out on your pagers so we that's how we knew what was there and it takes temporary monitors uh, to sort or block when you notice this stuff yep so we didn't we see it we just got an easier way to sort it awesome yeah there's plenty of options to reach that security endpoint there was another hand So the, that's the neat thing, right? The Which version you use is dependent on the browser itself. So the way it acts is going to determine the way it re reports violations and the way it actually takes action within itself. So for in our case, um, we as policy creation have those different options. Um, we haven't rolled out nonce yet, if that's your question. Um, that is on our roadmap. It's, it's next up. We, we need to have... I mean, there are a ton of features. We got out what we needed first to make it feasible and deployable and secure. And then there's quite a few other elements like that. Piyush, would you like to talk about those? Yeah, I mean, um, Nonce is a really great solution. I think we have tried it uh, in the past. Uh, the only thing is it doesn't play very well with, uh, with, let's say, your event handlers and event listeners, right? So if you have those in your page, which most likely everybody have, there's a massive effort required to move away from uh, event handlers and then simply to add a, a scriptlet kind of thing in your page uh, within the script tag, right, which you could add nouns to. Right? We have unsafe hashes. You could probably use those, but uh, I don't know. In my experience, I have seen that unsafe hashes, hashes as well like do not play very well uh, when it comes to different browsers. For some reason, different browsers compute the hashes a different way. Maybe there is a space over there here. Maybe there is a different character which like changes the hash a little bit which breaks your application so i don't know why it shouldn't be there and i haven't tested it recently but i think that's the problem we faced with unsafe hashes so i mean unless you have a web application which is completely free of event handlers and event listeners evals and these kind of things it's very difficult to like remove unsafe inline and just to go to nonce right and then unsafe inline and nonce also do not play with each other right so you, you can use either one of them. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.